So um, welcome, folks. Thanks for coming uh, to the State of the Net panel. Um, I think the title of this, and forgive me because I have not prepared one second for this besides um, <laughs> putting it all together. Um, as a moderator, I am not um, where I should be. However, um, I believe the title is something like Tech Policy Literacy, What Level of Knowledge Does a uh, Policymaker Need? And frankly, we, you know, my pretty much my entire professional career, I was recruited by uh, the person in the next room, Deirdre Mulligan, who's speaking on the AI panel, um, to do this to this job. And the core of it was the Congressional Internet Caucus work on the Hill. Um, and let me, if, if I can give you just a nugget of historical reference points here. Um, back in, <laughs> I hate to say back in the day, because I'm uh, back in like 1995, there was a senator from Nebraska. His name was um, Senator Rexon. And um, the internet was a couple of years old, the World Wide Web. Um, the Mosaic browser was in wide uh, use. Um, Net Mark Andreessen was thinking about making a public company called Netscape. And uh, Senator Exxon walked around the Senate floor with a binder of images, printout of in images, and he said to his fellow senators, do you know what the internet is? you know what the World Wide Web is? No members had uh, uh, websites. They didn't use email. Um, Senator Kennedy might have had a website, but it was like, uh, the, the address, the URL was mit.eu slash tilde uh, s. Kennedy. And that was his website, his congressional website. Nobody had it. Nobody knew what it was. And he said, Senator, have you seen the World Wide Web? And he opened up his binder. And of course, it is printouts of naked people um, doing all sorts of <laughs> things in the state of undress. <laughs> and um, he basically went around all the senators and said, we need to stop this. This is going to be un uh, just this, this World Wide Web thing is just pornography. And it's basically just penthouse on these electronic um, uh, devices that the military made in our internet. By the time he was done, if you ask any one of those 100 senators, have you seen the World Wide Web? They would have said, yes, Senator Exxon's binder. And that was the level of tech policy literacy in 1996 when they passed the Communications Decency Act. So as a baseline, what, and, you know, what level of, the question is, what level of tech policy literacy do we need members of Congress and staff to get to to make sound decisions in this area? I hear it all the time. I'm like, why can't we get members to be computer science majors? Why can't we get more technologists in Congress? And I think, I think the question we have today, one honest question about how does this all work? How do members you know, legislate? How do they you know, intake information? And how do they come to the best possible decision with the amount of information um, necessary. So that's, the, that's what we wanted to do today, and we had three or four, three or four different perspectives on that topic. Um, I am totally unprepared, so if I say anything, um, I'll be just devil with advocate, um, or I'll be a total like Luddite. So I'm perfectly suited to be a, a moderator for this. So let me introduce the, the folks that we have. Next to me is Daniel Schulman, who's the Policy Director for Demand Progress. Um, he leads, uh, leads their efforts on um, accountability and transparency. Um, Will Reinhardt um, is the Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at the American Action Forum, and Will uh, and I go back a long way. Um, Stacy Hutchinson, who we really appreciate um, coming. Uh, Stacy is um, with um, uh, the newly named Monument Advocacy. Um, and she's a principal there. She's had stints uh, working for uh, members of Congress, and she, she knows this stuff, um, how, how this stuff works in and out from that perspective in the private sector now. And then Lorelai Kelly, and Lorelai is a senior fellow and director at the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. Um, she leads the resilient, de resilient Democracy effort there. So that's our, that's our panel. Since I've not prepared, I'm going to expect a lot of questions from you, the audience, and uh, we'll, we'll chew on them a bit. Is that a good, is that a good setup? And, and not too many minutes. So let me, if I can, just start perhaps with, um, I did note that in 1996 when the Communications Decency Act passed, literally no, no United States Senator had any idea what the internet was. And that's why the Congressional Internet Caucus was created to be like, okay, this internet thing has potential, maybe you shouldn't kill it. Um, it, was a, it was a modest proposal. Um, I will say this, two years later, um, you know, the, the Telecom Act of 96 is really not it's, it has a little bit of life left in it, but it's not that much. Two years later, um, the members of Congress passed um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. They created Th Thomas in that time frame. There would seem to be a lot of early work, despite a total lack of understanding of the internet. There hasn't been a tremendous amount since, um, but you know things can get done in a total vacuum of knowledge. Um, but that's not ideal, is it? So let me let me just go to Stacy first and say, Stacy, 
you have worked with members on, on the inside, trying to get them staffed up, trying to get them to understand the issue. What role, uh, what's, what's, how do members kind of internalize this information when they're going from, you know, today it's uh, like Congressman Latta probably has given three speeches since he gave this one this morning. He's probably on his third speech of the day, and he's probably talking about some obscure tax proposal. So how do members actually get to the level of knowledge where the people in the in state of the net, and this is like the, kind of the cathedral of internet policy, we would love them to know everything, right? But what's realistic, and how do they do this? Uh, they do it by staff, <laughs> <laughs> right? So every congressional office, House and Senate, has a number of different staff um, that are experts on these different issues. And I use air quotes to say experts because usually a um, legislative assistant um, or legislative director will have, you know, two or three issues um, at, at a minimum in their portfolio, but um, the, the members themselves really rely on the staff <clears throat> to get up to speed on issues when they need to be up to speed on the issues, right? So if we're talking about um, the National Defense Reauthorization, maybe they're not super focused on data privacy that week, um, but when data privacy is up and they're, you know, going through it in committee, they are reading, the members say, are reading a lot of different reports, a lot of different um, perspectives from industry, from different um, industry groups, from governments, um, you know, GDPR, for instance, from foreign governments. Um, they'll, you know, really go to school and, and take that to task so that they can, you know, understand what they're going to be talking about, whether it's during a speech or in a committee hearing. Um, and to take that a step further, I think obviously the staff is getting their information, you know, yes, from reading um, a ton, whether it's online or CRS reports or American Action Forum reports, um, but they also rely heavily on industry um, to come in, the businesses that are actually um, putting this, these technologies into practice and putting these um, regulations and laws to work. Um, and how that's affecting their business, how that's affecting the technology that they're running um, is all very important. And I think that that, you know, that um, role is really beholden to the industry and the representatives um, to come and educate the staff members and, you know, de facto, the members of Congress themselves. If you were to say, you know, where, like how, when they reach out, are they reaching out to, you know, from in the private sector, are they reaching out to folks in, you know, in the, the policy apparatus here in Washington, or are they going to other places? Are they go to different sources. They go to their local state university. Where do they go for information? I hope both, frankly. I mean, I hope that you know a member. I worked for a member from Minnesota, for instance, and um, he was big on the medical device tax. And so when we talked medical device tax, we were going to you know industry groups that were based here in Washington. We were going to 3M, for instance, that was based you know in his home district in Minneapolis. So you know when it comes to technology, I hope that the, the members of Congress and their staffs are relying on their districts and their states for information. Obviously, that's, you know, their constituencies and that's who they represent, but also, you know, the, the broader swath of, of the subject matter experts that, that actually lie in this town, but also in Silicon Valley and Seattle and St. Louis and um, Atlanta and, and everywhere in between. So, Lorelai, you've done a lot of work on um, trying, to, trying to funnel expertise from specific districts to the members' like intake of information and decision-making. Um, I think one thing that people that don't understand civics <laughs> is that we live in a representational democracy, um, and members of Congress come from different places, um, and they, their constituencies aren't, they don't look necessarily, uh, unless you're Eleanor Holmes Norton, like Washington, D.C. That's for sure. Um, can people hear me? I'm going to... Uh, so uh, I came to D.C. from Silicon Valley, and it just occurred to me when I got interested in technology... Um, the lexicon itself, which you just mentioned, is huge. Just think about it. In California, a hacker is an artist. In DC policy circles, it's often a word for a criminal. In California, disruption is a business plan. In DC, it's a whole category of national security threats. In California, a carrier is Verizon. And in DC, it's a big landing strip in the ocean for Navy jets. Um, I've actually had these conversations in between California and DC. I think what we're seeing now, which is a huge opportunity, is um, with this last election, you've got uh, uh, members of Congress who are newly elected who sort of hit escape velocity uh, as soon as they got into Congress. They're revolutionizing Instagram and bringing the American public along with civics in a way that possibly only the musical Hamilton has done for us as a nation. Um, but you've also got members in there who still think that um, 
the tab key is a miracle instead of uh, tapping spacebar five times. <laughs> so we've got a, a, ch a chance now here in DC, and I think that this community is extremely important right now, and I'm assuming most people here are around DC, because proximity will always be most important for Congress because, because politics is about relationships that will leverage technology. It's not going to be the technology that leverages the relationships. And so I would just put that out there as the chance we have right now. There's a new special select committee on modernization. This is huge. Uh, the president signed the Open Government Data Act into law two weeks ago. This is huge. How do we bring the first branch of government along with that? And finally, uh, Congress has agreed to bring back a partial uh, technology capacity at Government Accountability Office. These three things I always do sort of like the trifecta of bringing Congress into the 21st century. So that's something we can talk about. Okay. Um, and just keying off of that, like um, Danielle and Will, um, there seems to be, I, a lot of these conversations say we can solve these problems if we just build more kind of infrastructure and institutions. Um, we've gone through a period recently where Congress seems to not want, want to build a lot of institutions and bureaucracy and, and, and those type of capacities. Let's be honest. Like, if the, con the Congress here before for the last several years has not has been said, but let, let big, big, big government, as Reagan would say, is, is the problem. So let's not make more government. Um, but is there things that you know Congress can do to kind of better their intake on information and make more sound decisions? And what level of tech literacy do they need to get to? Before we start, yeah, please. So, so first of all, just just make see how many people in this room are have worked on the Hill. Would you just raise your hand? All right, this is helping. How many people in this room are lawyers or lobbyists? All right, so th this is. Uh, <laughs> I'm both. Right, I'm a lawyer and a lobbyist, and I've worked on the Hill, and I've worked at CRS and the whole thing. So, I mean, so, this, so just a couple points to start. There are 1,000 fewer House committee staff now than there was 25 years ago. There's 2,000 fewer people at the Government Accountability Office. There's 100 fewer people at the Congressional Research Service. Where I used to work, there's about a 20% decrease on the Senate side as well. Uh, the New York Times had a story this weekend where they talk about the career paths where people get to Congress. Um, most of them are lawyers and lobbyists or business folks. I think there's eight members of Congress who have a STEM background. So that gives you sort of a perspective in terms of what's been happening inst institutionally. And one of the things that happened institutionally uh, almost 20, 20 years ago now uh, was the demise of the Office of Technology Assessment, which is one of the things uh, that I think that we'll be talking about. And, and like Laura, I hit the Open Government Data Act. I've been on that legislation. Flat Congress, I call it the Fixed Congress Committee. You know, like this is an opportunity to change things. It's not the only place. Um, but for many years, Congress was advised by uh, an authoritative, independent agency called the Office of Technology Assessment. And its purpose was to help make Congress smarter about technology. Now, there are other folks who have this responsibility. Of course, the committees have this responsibility through their staff, and individual members have these uh, sort of these capacities as well. But OTA's job was sort of analogous to CRS, which was, uh, so CRS provides uh, timely uh, advice on matters of importance before Congress. GAO provides sort of watchdogging investigations. They do sort of in-depth research. And OTA creates sort of long-form investigations where they brought in all the stakeholders, assess the issues, and provide a menu of options for policyholders. Uh, and when I testified before Ledger Manager Probes last year, one of the striking things that came out was this is the most requested thing that the Democratic members of the House had asked for. Hundred and something members of the House had put in their appropriations requests to restore funding for OTA. So it's worth remembering why it was killed. It was killed for two reasons. One was the idea that, well, you know, government needs to be smaller, so we're going to start at home. Uh, well, I can tell you that, you know, that has happened and then in spades, the House of Representatives in terms of its funding is 10% below uh, 2010 levels. Like, Congress is, you know, appreciably smaller, but the executive branch is appreciably larger. So the ability to oversee all the things that are happening, Congress is, like, sort of the oxygen in the room for them, their expertise, like, all that has diminished as a consequence. And one of those pieces, of course, is OTA. So the, the theory is bring it back in some fashion. Some folks simply want to like, like balloon, blow back up the thing that was, that was demolished. Oh, I should mention, the other reason it was killed off uh, was to empower industry and to weaken independent congressional expertise. Like, that was not an incidental effect. That was the point, right? There were concerns that these were truth tellers. They would say things like global warming is real and the Laffer curve doesn't work. Uh, and people didn't like this. This also killed off a division of CRS, by the way. The, there's a reason there's no economics department. Uh, it was killed off because they would say things like the Laffer curve is not real. And, and members of Congress didn't like the idea of having these types of truth tellers. Uh, so the idea is to have, again, 
technologists, experts, uh, people who can provide neutral, independent advice to help Congress understand these issues so that when you look at internet policy, which was something that was funded through DARPA, that Congress, you know, Al Gore went around saying he invented the internet. Well, he didn't invent it, but he was responsible for creating it in large respect by putting the funding towards it. Like, a lot of these innovations are driven through congressional attention, and OTA is something that can help sort of uh, create the roadmap or, or identify the landscape so that members can better understand the types of things that are the challenges that we'll be facing them. Sorry, that was very long, but no, no. hopefully that helps. No, no. Do you have any um, perspective on the... Yeah, so, I mean, it's... I guess, the, but my feeling about, I mean, I know we have been talking a lot about OTA, I've written a lot about it, Daniel's obviously written a lot about it as well. Uh, to me, it seems like, and, and I think actually you laid out some of the major problems here, that OTA really is a, the, the fall of OTA, I think, is a symptom, not necessarily itself a cause. Um, you know, there has been a clear decline in the number of staff that you've seen at the congressional level. You've had, uh, especially like Senator Lee talking about, about trying to reinvigorate um, the congressional, uh, Congress as being kind of a, the leader in this space. But at the same time, you've seen a decline in the number of staff. The, it's not necessarily a winning political argument to say that I need more staff and I need to spend more money. So there is also this tension, I think, that we need to be very cognizant of that politically, that um, that the optics of these sorts of things, of, of, of even embedding more intelligence in, in Congress may seem like a good thing to us, but optically, politically, it's not really the best winning argument. You know, people just, I mean, I've heard a lot of this from, from, from you know, from politicians, even at the local level, that, you know, saying that we need more support and we need more staff is just, an, it's just, a, it's, it's a tough sell for a lot of people, and you're not going to be able to sell this to to local constituencies. Now, that isn't to say that we don't need expertise. I'm just saying that the pressures are also, I think, very, very important. The one thing I had mentioned about this, which, I mean, we talked about 1996, and I think it's kind of an interesting, um, it's really an interesting time, because 1996, and there's really been some very interesting work done on this, seems to be the point at which congressional offices themselves sort of switched and changed what their actual kind of functions actually seem to be. That when we think about congressional offices now and, and committee staff, there's a lot of communication staff because you're constantly trying to deal with, you know, the 24-hour news cycle. The fun thing that I, you know, this is a small side note, the 24-hour news cycle used to mean that you had 24 hours to figure out what was going on before you had to deal with the news cycle, which when I started learning about that, I was like, wait a second, that's not how I know it. But that's what we've gone to. We've... The, the media landscape has changed the demands of what a political office needs to output. And part of that output is communication and what that communication necessarily means, and I, I hope we'll get, get a little bit into this, is that some of the things that you're gonna be doing um, will be optically driven. And I think the, the big highlight for me is that, for example, we had a, a recent hearing about, about Google and there was a lot of criticism uh, about the members and the members using this time to effectively like say, you know, why are my Google rankings so low? Or, you know, why is it that I don't seem to be appearing very high in the Google rankings? Well, it's because the individuals um, at the end of the day are very driven by this sort of news cycle. So I think that at least, and I hope we can get a little bit more into this, I think we need to parse out these questions of, of policy from broader questions about politics. We care a lot about policy and we should care about policy but we have to be understanding that there is a political environment that you have to survive here. Yeah, so Stacey, um, that's a good question about, um, you know, the hearings, right? Like, how do how do members get to Washington? Like, this is a bit of a serious question. Like, they get elected, right? And, I mean, we also have to realize that there are two people that are they're sound, they're making sound policy, um, they're trying to make sound policy, but they also need to, they want to be, say, elected, but they're constituents, is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and touching on the hearings, I mean, everybody likes to beat up on the Zuckerberg Facebook hearings, what, a year or two ago? I don't even know how long ago that was now. Um, but it wasn't all that fair, right? Because I'm sure that the members, while they, you know, sounded like they didn't know anything about how Facebook worked or made money, um, I think that they actually truly did. And I think that if it wasn't for the, you know, five-minute time limits that they had while asking the questions and responding to the answers, um, you know, the, there would have been a lot more information kind of brought out, and I think there would have been a lot more knowledge shown from the senators um, and congressmen alike. So, you know, while I think it's hilarious and I also like to make fun of it, um, it's not it's not all that fair. But I will go back quickly to a, a story. Um, when I first started at CTEC at the chamber, we got called by a subcommittee um, on the Ed Workforce, 
And they said, you know, we really need you all to come in and brief us because our members think that the sharing economy is Uber and Lyft, and that's it. And so that was, but that was kind of a, a great use case of why an industry group like CTEC at the chamber, right, which had a bunch of different members in the technology space and the gig economy space and the sharing economy space, could kind of go in and, and literally educate, right? Like this is the perspective of Postmates, this is the perspective of Uber, this is the perspective of Lyft, et cetera. And, and you know, not political, not biased, but just this is, you know, this is the facts, this is what how we operate, this is what we're doing kind of thing. And, and to kind of educate on a, in a safe space too, um, to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, sorry to answer your, your question. <laughs> that, um, yeah. You know, they, they are, I mean, the politics matters, right? They've got to get reelected, the constituents matter, they care about, you know, what their members of Congress are take, talking about and taking up issue-wise. and what level of expertise they have on different issues when it matters. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of pressures. Yeah, and we, yeah, we come from, we have Amazon HQ2 coming in here soon across the street there. Um, we live in a very tech environment. Like DC is a pretty, pretty, pretty tech environment, whether Virginia, Maryland. Um, and we don't realize that some members come from places where they don't see a lot of, you know, tech in their daily lives besides the phones that they're using, um, it's really not a core driver of jobs in their, their district. Um, jobs and constituents are the things that members care about, number one. Um, and, and, the, and the trick is to get them caring about this industry. And they're in fairness to them, let's just kind of look at it. How many, in, in the internet industry, there is no internet industry. The internet's kind of a platform that is subsuming all other industries. But um, they're, like, if you were in mining, you know, that those, so those issues don't change that much over time. Insurance doesn't change that much over time. It's glacial change, you know, from the marketplace compared to what I've experienced in my job since I started to take this job like 21, 20 years ago. It's just shocking. I, you know, anti, we just went to school this morning on antitrust, right? I haven't had to do antitrust since the Microsoft days when I was in law school. So, you know, it, now, uh, if you would if, say the net, this is the 15th year. So 2004, there was no antitrust at State of the Net in 2004. <laughs> like, there was no, the internet companies didn't, like, most, most industries just dismissed the internet and the internet companies. Um, so things change really rapidly. And um, I think it's really difficult for members, particularly in this space, to really start understanding these, these things. And the privacy issue right now um, is m fractally complex, way more complex than we, we thought it was, you know, even 15 years ago. Um, so, Lorelei, like, going, to, going back to the question, like, at, at those hearings with the Zuckerberg hearings and the Google CEO, um, obviously uh, the format's kind of tricky for members to actually <laughs> make any good points or actually get to any answers. You know, but the question is, like, there, uh, were there any members that didn't have enough resources at that hearing to get to, get to understand what that issue was? Well, I think that's probably for sure. And I think probably for a member of Congress, the most important thing is being able to ask good questions, topical questions, um, as much as providing uh, expert answers. Um, my sense that my project at Congress is, is uh, on crowdsourcing expert capacity in Congress. Um, essentially, what I've discovered in working in three different districts, one of them's rural, one of them's suburban, and one of them's urban, is that we need to build a, a trust engine for Congress. We call this building a Congress stack. And the idea is where can you go back to already trusted infrastructure for sharing information? Because one thing Congress has lost in the last 20 years is its knowledge commons. Um, the House and Senate used to share far more sort of synopses or staff or convening mechanisms. Um, you notice in the hearings when the House and Senate did theirs together, that was a better hearing. It was a far more rich, um, set of questions and answers, because you just had more computer science expertise among the members. So why, why don't every subcommittee have a stack exchange, a Q&A site, before a season of hearings? I actually just pitched this to TechCrunch <laughs> um, for the Committee on Modernization, which is create a curated mechanism that's trusted and in the realm of journalism that's also creates sort of a supply chain of information into policy that is auditable, that creates more discourse, that is in the formative stages of policy, so it's not such a third rail in DC. So there's this whole realm of ideas that I think Congress used to generate when it was more sort of an analog system in general. Um, we work more with the House and the Senate because the House is like the risk aggregator for the Senate on tech. I think this, the Senate, I think it's waiting for its entire fleet of messenger pigeons to die before it moves to flares. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a, 
and then email. Um, so the Senate is just a harder on the communications front. But it's also really important because every senator represents an entire state. And ideally, would be able to uh, regenerate a shared knowledge system at the state level, now with tech and data, allowing for synchronous and asynchronous information, um, cybersecurity is going to remain extremely important. The decentralized web is going to be part of this. But what we need right now, and this is what I found with every member I work with, they're all trying something new. They're all trying to figure out how to bridge this time and space disruption. Um, in Arkansas, Wi-Fi is, is defeated by a rainstorm and a tin roof. I'm from a farm in northern New Mexico. I just got snowed in for a week um, uh, with no, actually we couldn't even get down the hill because there's no plowing. Um, it takes three hours to watch anything on cable, so I completely understand. This is a lot of Americans. And I would argue that this sort of red, blue, urban, rural divide, that the, our, our overcoming that antagonism that is metastasizing with social media and with the sort of monetized um, memes and, and the kind of money that has weaponized information that should be protected for policy purposes, that, that the solution to that is coming back together as a nation, is how we configure this next iteration of our, our tech and data. That's, I, a, that's a big, you know, how do we, how do we control disinformation, amplification? All of it is huge, We have more right? on that later today. Okay, yeah. But I can, I'd be happy to give examples. Like, we're working on a digital field hearing. Everything I do is already within the rules of Congress. So we're not trying to build sort of an exoskeleton, but actually working within the institution to see what it's done in its past and what you could build on that just uses new tools. Like what a stack exchange for the subcommittees. In the 70s, there was something called a subcommittee bill of rights, where they, they wrote down what they would like to be doing as the subject matter expertise layer of Congress. Think of, you know, we call it the Congress stack. But there's no reason now that there can't be secure, trusted, public interest uh, information feeds into subcommittees, into committees, um, the, uh, the other part of this that's really important is the distortion of policymaking where the authorization process, which is the sort of ner nerdy information, trial balloon, idea, place, has just moved into the appropriations process, and they're not c equipped with the staff to do it. So I did promise to go to, um, because I'm so poorly prepared, we go to eager to audience questions early, so get, get them ready. Um, let me give um, Will and, and Daniel a chance to kind of uh, key off of what um, uh, Casey and, and Laura said. No, go ahead. So I, I actually uh, bore you guys with like crazy details. So I put out a study on Friday where I was looking at House committees. Adjusted for inflation, House committees are $100 million less than they were uh, about 10 years ago. So, uh, so down by about a quarter. So when, when Laura is talking about like all of these different interesting ways of approaching things, you have to realize that they're doing this with a, such a smaller piece of the pie. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I think is worth looking at is, is having, like, real-world comparators. So let's look at the legislative branch versus the executive branch. A lot of what Congress has created has been in response to not trusting the executive branch. So you've got the American Law Division of CRS, where I used to work, because you don't trust the lawyers at OLC. And you've got CBO, because you don't trust OMB. Uh, like this, you know, and you've got, um, you know, the President's Science Advisory Board and the, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it now, the... They didn't staff anybody up until like last week. They just appointed the 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 science. I can't think of what's OSCP, right? And an OTA, which is equivalent, or the Science and Technology Committee, which was run by a guy who didn't believe in global warming. So like that's like that's the analogs that we're dealing with. Um, you know, there has been I think some really interesting things that are happening right now. So we're seeing rhetorical shifts. So for a long time, like the political point that Will was raising was a real good one. You know, like. You know, we shouldn't pay these congressional staff anything, blah, 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 right? And that goes on and on. And then you see some members start to say things like, um, people should be paid a living wage. You know, they shouldn't have to work two jobs. You know, when you look at the average congressional staffer, and I've looked at this, uh, you know, in the House side, so they're there for a year or two, you know, and then they're 20. And there's nothing wrong with being in your 20s. Uh, I remember them fondly, it was a while ago. Um, but you should have people who are, ex you know, who have done this for a while, as well as people who are looking at it with fresh eyes. The Senate's slightly more experienced, but not a whole lot better. CRS is churning staff out. The government shutdown is going to, it changes the, the calculus for, for the way a lot of staff look at what their career path is. Uh, so all of these things sort of factor into what it means 
yeah. what, it mean, what it means for Congress to be popular. Yeah, <laughs> so, 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 so the hope is that. By the way, uh, so, so we, did, we did look at yeah. uh, in addition to staffing. Yeah. Uh, we did look um, last. The last Congress was in session of like eighteen percent less. So here in the city, eighteen percent less than it had been, you know, eight years prior. So, so the good news, and there is good news. One is that the the House rules themselves have changed significantly. The Democrats, when they came in, as did the Republicans ten years ago, when they came in, have modernized the way it functions. Uh, and there is real desire. We saw this through the last led branch approach process that the Republicans led. We're going to see it again with the Democrat led. There is a real desire to put money back into this. So there is, there is a desire to address some of the underlying capacity questions and address some of the underlying technology questions. So there is that kind of sea change. And, and as devil's advocate, um, and I'll hand that off to, to Will, um, you know, there's an argument to be said that more staff, more resources don't necessarily you know, contribute to better policy making. There's a theory out there. Um, and, you know, other countries are run like that. Like Australia is, like, is basically run by like, autocrats or technocrats. I'm not quite sure what the word is. Um, and people take issue with their decisions on these issues. You know, the same in the European Commission. Um, so, Will, I mean, is it all, is it all, does it all just mean you need more time here in Washington and more staff and more resources? Or No, I, I, so I think these highlight two real problems here. So one thing that I would say is that, you know, before the expert question or expertise question, I get to that. The, the one thing I think that Congress actually could do is um, conduct surveys of their own staff like the rest of the federal agencies do. You know, there's this federal agency survey that anyone that's worked in a, a um, executive level um, agency typically has to take. So something along those lines that's consistent is just figuring out what, what people actually need, the kind of resources they need, how they're feeling about their jobs. You know, it's it, it just very minimal HR work actually probably just needs to be done at a very base level. Then we can figure out, I mean, about these about the uh, salary problems that you're clearly talking about. Um, that's also another issue I've heard from members, staff members. I mean, I think I probably would be working on the Hill if it weren't for the fact that you, it's actually just quite difficult to live in this city and to be at, a, you know, at the level that I would probably be at. But more about this expertise issue, I think that we need to think critically about what the outputs of this kind of expertise process is actually gonna look like. What are the goals that we're trying to, to maximize? Are we just trying to maximize more you know, more legislation, that to me isn't necessarily the best thing. Um, the fact that Congress is hamstrung means that they're not doing as much, which means they're not doing as many good things, but they're also not doing as many bad things. So the question of, I think that we really do need to be thinking about critically is this, is what is the output? Um, you know, the EU, it has a lot of expertise. They have, they don't have the kind of um, external nonprofit policy making uh, relationships that we typically have here in DC. They're far more internalized. You have, you know, if you're typically an economist or somebody who's worked in technology, there's a much higher likelihood that you'll be able to go and work for work in Brussels. Uh, the output of that are some very, um, in some ways, very worrying pieces of legislation, I would say. And then, in fact, we do know that experts are pretty bad at predicting what's going to happen in the future. We also know that generally experts, at least in expert areas, typically aren't, you know, again, aren't just aren't that good about predicting what is um, what really should be the best course. And, but that's not to say anything about experts, not to say that that they're that they're any worse than anyone else. It's just that it's really, really hard to predict what we necessarily need in the future, how the laws, even if we do have a law or a proposed law, how that's really going to impact a larger society you know, once it goes to the courts and how it's interpreted, how, what that actually means. So there, there's, there's a lot of nuance here that, that, yes, I do think we should be talking about expertise, but the question is, where does that expertise get inputted and where does it fall within the larger decision-making processes? And to me, that is, that's a really, really difficult question to, to begin to answer. Yeah, so just, just two things. One is that uh, most of the G, uh, G15 countries have uh, an OTA-like entity that's actually modeled after our OTA, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and the other is that, uh, you know, I think that there, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but people aren't entitled to their own facts. That there are some things that are fundamentally a bite baseline about the world. We used, uh, this isn't funny, but this was a joke that we had at CRS, is about, you know, if you would write these reports and you have to say things on one hand, people see, say the world is round, and other people, on the other hand, people say the world is flat, right? Like some, there are some types of arguments that there is value of having experts 
who can say things like there's value in having an expert panel. Like we didn't go and grab five people off the street to come up here. Like there, there is utility in having, well, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there, there is value in having um, expert advice. That's the value of having industry come because they know their industry. That's the value of having folks, you know, so, so while, you know, there can be an anti-expert argument made so long as we live in a democratic system and we don't abolish Congress, um, there will be a need for Congress to have people to rely on uh, to figure out what's going on. I've not seen any reason for Congress to abolish Congress. Uh, I've got some stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure we have a bunch of questions for the speakers. I know that Rick Lane certainly does. Um, and, and other experts like, uh, yes, please. That, that's a really good question. It's just, it's just my personal understanding. Like, I have difficulty grasping concepts unless I've actually had experience with them. Other people are different. So how would you respond to that question? It's a good one. So, so there, there's two things. One is that many of these things are being used inside Congress, but, they sh but they're not allowed to be. So many congressional offices have Slack. Many congressional offices have, uh, have Dropbox. Many of them use, like, Google Forms when you submit your appropriations request. Like, you know, th these, these, aren't, these aren't folks in, like, a bubble. I mean, the members, it's a little bit different, right? So there was the WikiLeaks leak a couple years ago for the email addresses for members, and like it was this, like astonishing high number of people had AOL email addresses uh, or didn't have an email address at all. So like, th I mean, there are there's definitely like disparities um, that that mirror that mirror sort of background, but a lot of the constraints in terms of being familiar with this stuff has to do with Congress is one of the most attacked institutions from like foreign threats. Uh, the underlying technological infrastructure behind there has been underinvested for like 20 or 30 years. Like the information revolution largely has not come to the way they run their operation. And the consequence of that means that um, if you want to see how an amendment changes the bill in real time, you have to get a person to do it by hand. Like there are, the, like, there are those real world consequences. Well, let, me, let me go to that state thing. Because Jason, you've been in a room with you know, members and with leaders, and you're trying to get across a concept, and you're trying to, you're trying to get the decision made. What is that? Is there a disconnect there? Is that a challenge that we're not actually, the member doesn't have familiarity with that, familiarity with that technology? So you have to refer to metaphor, so to say. Well, Congressman, it's, 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 it's like a... Sure, of course, of course. But I would also, I mean, kind of flip that on its, on its head a little bit and say, I mean, is a member of Congress supposed to understand how a pacemaker works if they don't have one? Right? Are they supposed to understand how a medical device works if they don't have one? So, yes, it is up to the staff. I mean, hopefully, you know, if there's something that, you know, is before Congress that has to do with Dropbox, we will have heard from, you know, someone from Dropbox or their representatives um, to kind of be able to understand where they're coming from. I would argue, maybe I'm naive, but I would argue that most of the staff that's dealing with technology policy would have at least heard of Dropbox, if not used it mo many times. I know I've been using it for years. Um, but, you know, it, it's up, it is up to the staff to use analogies. It is up to the staff to kind of liken it to different things. Um, but also I think it's up to, you know, the members, I would hope, again, maybe naive, that they would take an interest and maybe seek it out a little bit, right? Like, go read about it. Go pull up Dropbox.com and see how it works and see how, you know, some use cases, um, you know, would be applied to them. And, and not just necessarily in their congressional office, but how other constituents are using that service or how other businesses in their district are also using it. Um, can, I, can I just follow up on one more thing? I, at the beginning, I said that you know, Congressman Lada has probably already given three other speeches today in the time that he gave this one this morning on different topics that are you know, equally complex. What is, what is the day of the life of a member of Congress when they, co when they come, they fly in, they flew in last night or this morning, um, and then they fly out again on, I don't know, if anything, th Friday or something? What, what is the day, what is a day like for them? So how, how much time do they have to ingest information and play around with Dropbox? Let me just tell that answer a little bit different way. So have you ever seen a briefing book for a member of Congress or their, you know, their Dropbox perhaps with all their documents for the next day or the next week? I mean, if you see a member of Congress on an airplane, no doubt he is reading through, she is reading through, you know, 90, 100 pages worth of, of speeches, of letters to constituents, of bill text, of background information. Um, so that prep work, and it's not necessarily, it, it shouldn't ever be done the night before, right? I mean, it's usually done weeks in advance. It's usually done on the plane ride to 
um, DC or home from um, DC for any consistent work they've got to do. But, you know, I mean, it, it, yes, you know, there is very little time to actually um, get in the weeds on anything on a, on a normal day, but they make time for it after hours. They make time for it, you know, on airframes, on train rides, um, you know, in between meetings, et cetera. So. Other, other questions? Um, Peter. Peter, can you just identify yourself? Oh, yeah, sorry. My name is Peter Fidelling. I'm working for a European Union delegation here, here in Washington. Maybe the panel can tell me a bit more how, how they see the role of the, the higher education and universities, both in providing staffers, you know, training them. Is, is an engineering or a law degree enough? Or what do you think about that? And on the other side, the university providing science and scientific output. Is, is this something which should flow in the process? Thank you. So yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, why don't why don't members look at their like state university system as a, a great resource on these issues? Yeah, one of the first layers of this con Congress stack that I look at in districts is the role of land grant and public university community colleges. The reason this is so important is that the original purpose of the land grant system was to bring in rural America into the best of modern knowledge. Um, why don't we have, and they created something called the Cooperative Extension Program, which is the actual staff mechanism in thousands of counties across the United States to share that information and implement it in pilots with farmers, for example. Um, why don't we have a digital extension service right now? Why haven't we repurposed the public and land grant system for that? One of the reasons it's so important for this layer of our uh, trust engine for Congress for policymaking is that um, these schools have a much easier time integrating with and accessing Congress than anybody else. I know this because going from Georgetown, I talked to the Ethics Committee about projects I'm doing, and they say, you can't do that, not at Georgetown. Georgetown's a private entity. It can't have access in the same way. The other, uh, the other entity that could do this are called the Federal Depository Libraries. Many, um, Many schools have them, Georgetown has one, so that's the way I could work as a faculty member there. But it, that's the best question you could ask. I mean, in the 90s, I think it was the Kellogg Commission, they did a whole revamp of thinking about the public and land grant system. And in the, and I can send this to you, it's like a scanned PDF online, if, if you wanna uh, Google it, I can send it to you, or I'll tweet it. Um, it is a really wonderful set of uh, recommendations for the public university system in this country to become this public serving, rapid response knowledge system. And the beauty of it for Congress is that it creates a uh, competitive political constituency um, for high quality knowledge. You saw this happen with uh, crowdsourcing, or citizen science, by the way, with the Flint, Michigan water crisis. That was Virginia Tech partnering with families in Flint to come up with affiliated data that was structured in a way that was compelling to Congress. I think that how do we decentralize um, the knowledge functions of Congress? Um, and this is like a new division of labor for civics in the United States. Like why aren't citizens already being included and asked to contribute more um, than just showing up every couple of years to vote? Like that's a really interesting question to ask too for citizens in the United States. Is, yeah, so just, just three very quick things. Sorry, one is that this is a role for some of these support offices and agencies to play. So GAO and CRS should, but don't really look at this type of stuff. The second is that academics tend to operate on an academic cycle and Congress operates on a Congress cycle. So they don't really communicate very well together and oftentimes academia doesn't know how to write things in a way that is actually useful for Congress. So, so I. Uh, and we see, you know, like the UK has, has different, like the, the, the Technology Assessment Office, they actually just recently put out a study where they talk about how they're actually making use of the academic expertise that is arising outside, uh, throughout the UK. So this type of thing can be done, but it's not being done well right now, at least in the US. Can I actually, yeah, just one small comment. This is actually one of my major issues and one of the reasons why I, um, when I was originally in academia, I kind of left it was because of this exact problem, at least at the congressional level. So I, at, at a congressional level, I think that there is at least a problem kind of, of educational inputs in that, in the way that you've mentioned. At the state level, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. 
because you know I uh, my father worked for the um, Institute for Government and Public Affairs in Illinois, and this was a you know a local. Um, it was supported by the University of Illinois, which I'm originally from Illinois, and it was a um, it was a resource that you know he used pretty extensively. There was a whole bunch of professors who worked there. And you see this in a lot of different states as well. You see, you know, the extension services, as, as, you know, that have already been mentioned, also be, you know, uh, providing expertise on, you know, agricultural problems within Illinois that I know specifically. But you see this at the state level. I think it's 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 just far easier to do it because of a locality problem, to be very honest. Um, now, you know, Georgetown provides some very, you know, good professors who are doing research in this space. You know, you have al also GMU has kind of a function along these lines. GW, the, the local um, and, and American University as well and Catholic. All those are actually very well, um, they have a lot of really, really great professors in Maryland that are interested in these, poli these issues. And in fact, some of my professors that I worked with at graduate level came to Maryland because they wanted to be closer to politics. So the local, the local schools, I think, actually do a pretty good job of this. The question is, uh, is there expertise that's located elsewhere that can be integrated within this kind of larger knowledge system? That, I think, is still very much just a local, kind of a local knowledge problem. And there's perhaps ways that we can kind of mitigate that and deal with it. But at the end of the day, I do think that at least at the state level, it's, it's a pretty good. I think it's pretty good, all things considered. And at the federal level here, we still have, again, we have a lot of expertise that's located here and it's, it's often... <laughs> It's often, you know, talked about or yeah. talked to. This time next year, you'll be sitting in John, where you are now, yeah. it's going to be Johns Hopkins University. Yep. <laughs> Rick. Uh, Rick Lang, CEO of Iggy Ventures. I was the first chamber person hired by Tom Donahue to do tech policy specifically back in 99. So you can imagine what it was like back then and talk to chamber members. But Stacey, you hit the nail right on the head about expertise. You know, Congress passes laws, but not every member of Congress is a lawyer. Congress passes a lot of policy that they are not experts in or didn't work for. And I think sometimes there's this mindset within the tech community that if you're only as smart as us, you understand how stupid you are, and we're going to do memes and point out how stupid you are, which is, I think, causing a lot of the backlash to the tech industry because these are policy issues. You know, you have a policy of cafe standards. I don't have to understand how a car works to say we want to have a policy of this type of mileage per gallon, or we want to do X, Y, and Z on policy issues. So I think too often the tech people focus too much on the tech side of it, understanding that there are complexities of privacy and cybersecurity and encryption, but at the same time, what members of Congress are trying to do is to set policies and then frame and figure out if the technology will work. We've gotten too much in the head, you know, far ahead where it's the, you know, legislating by code instead of legislating by policy and legislating by law. And I'm wondering if you think that tech backlash is really caused by some of the memes that we all like to laugh at, but members and, and staffers who are really working hard on these policy issues know these issues, they're solid on the issues, and I'm sure they don't appreciate the type of response they get from Silicon Valley and, and the tech community on you know, Facebook and Instagram and every place else. I think that's a major problem um, for technology companies because um, there are a million gazillion benefits that technology is is playing, you know, to our society and to every one of us sitting in this room. Um, and so I think we need to really be playing up those benefits and, and drafting and instituting policy that's going to encourage those benefits, right? And you know, yes, I mean, government is there and, and plays a role and needs to you know set some standards and some regulations when it's applicable, but not always, right? We don't necessarily need to have um, a regulation just because you know something happened in the in the data sphere, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think you know, so Will's part about the twenty four hour news cycle. I mean, it, it has done a detriment, I think, to um, policymakers and to Congress overall. Unfortunately, I mean, there are benefits to um, to you know super ongoing news, um, but there's also the the downside too. I mean, having twenty four hours to learn about something and respond as a previous um, communication staffer on the Hill would have been heaven. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think I think you're exactly right, and it, it's business too, right? I mean, we talk about talk about technology as you know as these platforms and these things that nobody understands. But at the end of the day, I mean, they're they are businesses, and they affect businesses overall. Whether we're talking about um, Google or Dropbox or AIG or um, Johns Hopkins University, for instance. So, yeah. um, if I can if I can interject, um, uh, I do think that I've talked to a lot of people. If if you really want, if your job and your main passion is to make sure you have sound policy making coming down from Capitol Hill. You want sound decisions 
on technology policy coming down from Capitol Hill, I assure you, making fun of members of Congress on Twitter is not the way to do that. It's counterproductive. It, that's a fact. So um, that, anyway, it, but if your job is to like you know do other things um, and you want to just tweet that stuff out and make fun of members of Congress, that's fine. But people whose job it is to assure sound policy making, that doesn't happen. Yes. We've been referring to tech expertise in a sort of monolithic way, it broke down a little bit uh, in a more nuanced way with the question about academia as a source of tech expertise. But my impression is that a lot of times when people refer to outside tech industry expertise, they mean professional lobbyists hired by large tech companies like Google, Facebook, et cetera. And as someone who works in the tech industry, but not as a lobbyist, not as a CEO of a large corporation, but as someone who has hundreds of friends and colleagues who are professional programmers, product managers, documentation writers, et cetera, who all have a wealth of expertise and interest and opinion on these political questions. I think some of the making fun that you see is a form of frustration because they don't see themselves or we don't see ourselves as having clear paths to influence Congress um, or the owners of the corporations that are purporting to speak for the entire tech industry. So I'm curious about what role you see for congressional staff or these institutions in providing a better pipeline to, uh, I guess, everyday tech workers. I can tell you what one of the things that um, that I, one of the other layers of this Congress stack I go to in, in districts is um, makerspaces and tech hubs. Um, and some of the times they're called accelerators. Uh, to your point, the local academia, like Arkansas State in Jonesboro, very connected to the member of Congress, lots of times because the member is an alum, for one thing. But um, that, that makerspace, which is innovative, it's collaborative, there's no civics built into it. Um, it's detached from that. But, but when I go to these interviews in these makerspaces or tech accelerators and bring it up, they would love to be included as sort of a local surge team for technical questions to venues for field hearings. So I think that, again, there's a way to, as we rebuild uh, um, our democratic institutions, um, to make sure that it's decentralized, secure, and public serving. And we can do it now. I mean, that's the beauty of this, is that we actually have the raw material to do this now. So I would argue, um, you know, members didn't even realize that there's a hackerlab.com, there's a, there's a map online that maps all the hacker spaces across the United States. A really helpful tool would be that didn't map that onto congressional districts or somehow have meetups. I always look at tech and data meetups in districts to see like what's going on in Nashville and go to those. And they don't think of offering their expertise to members. And so I think it's a two way, like there's this desperate desire to help and there's a sense of urgency, but it's finding each other now. But you're exactly right, those should be the local search teams. I, I would add to that too. I mean, I would, I know that this is putting the onus a lot on the programmers and the engineers, but I mean, if those people who had an interest in going to their member of Congress or any member of Congress and educating them, like go to their government affairs people and say, hey, can I come to meetings with you? You know, like I have something to add, or maybe they would be interested in my perspective, or can I send a letter on behalf of our company that, you know, says X, Y, and Z? I mean, I think that level of engagement at a company perspective um, would be awesome, and I think it would really translate um, to some of the knowledge base that, that the staffers and the members of Congress have, too. And I, again, you know, I mean, I realize that the, it's not their job, and that's asking them to do something added, um, but maybe it would make the whole process more collaborative, too. So I would just say, well, finally, like, it, it's useful to have people who are like you on the other side, right? So, like, Travis Moore is running Tech Congress, which is an effort to get people who are technologists to go and work for Congress. Congress itself isn't funded well enough to, to pay, pay folks the salaries that they need, as you know. Um, but, you know, people who work for Congress and help, help members think through the different issue sets ideally should have some background or expertise in the, in the matters in which they're, in which they're working. Uh, and people will often, you know, if Congress is staffed largely by lawyers, then we're going to think in the box of lawyers. And we, if you have, you want to have people who have different backgrounds who are able to talk and understand the different ways to engage with people outside. Great. That, that, that's fine. That's not my thing. <laughs>
this when they play the music and they tell you you're done. <laughs> but basically, I'm sorry. If you had a good, you had, a lot of people had questions. I apologize. Um, I, I need to ask you all a favor. Um, in about five minutes, down in the main plenary room, we have Congressman Jim Langevin and, and CEO uh, Corey Thomas from Rapid7 to do a, a pre-lunch um, keynote. So if we could all go down there and actually for the pre-lunch keynote, and then, then we can have lunch. But before that, I want to thank this amazing panel who basically showed up. I emailed them on Friday, basically, to show up. I told you so. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Daniel, it's okay.